Thank you for joining us for this conversation inspired by the exhibition, Jacob Lawrence, The American Struggle, which was organized by the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, and is on view at the Met until November 1st. The exhibition brings together for the first time in more than 60 years, the panels belonging to Lawrence's powerful but little known series, Struggle from the History of the American People, which he created between 1954 and 1956 in the midst of Senator Joseph McCarthy's Red Scare and critical years of the civil rights movement. Lawrence's visually arresting panels depict episodes from American history, some iconic, even folkloric, others lesser known, mostly from the American Revolution to early years of Western expansion. Lawrence's conceptual through line is the experience of struggle across American history, which cuts against traditional heroic narratives with triumphant predetermined outcomes. They also foreground the experiences and contributions of people of color and women, so often overlooked in standard retellings of US history. It has been an honor to work on this project with my co-curator, Sylvia Yont, Lawrence A. Fleischman, curator in charge of the American Wing. And I want to thank my numerous Met colleagues who gave, gave of their time and talent to bring it to fruition, especially under circumstances none of us could have predicted or desired. Thanks go especially to Mariana Siciliano, Managing Educator, Public Programs, who organized this virtual gathering. As Lawrence had for earlier projects, including his famous The Migration of the Negro, he conducted research for his struggle series at the 135th Street branch of the New York Public Library, now the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Consequently, the exhibition presented an exciting opportunity to partner with colleagues at the, at the Schomburg. We are pleased to present the following discussion between three distinguished scholars on the resonant theme of struggle, not only as it relates to Lawrence's historical work, but as it permeates Black lives and experiences. The conversation will be led by Kevin Young, director of the Schomburg Center. A distinguished poet, author, and historian, Mr. Young has published 13 books of poetry and prose, and in addition to his leadership position at the Schomburg, he is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, among many other accolades and awards. He will be joined by Tammy Lawson, Curator of Art and Material Culture at the Schomburg Center, which in addition to historical texts and manuscripts, preserves and exhibits African art, African American historical artifacts and artwork from the Harlem Renaissance, the Works Progress Administration, and the Black Arts Movement of the 1960s and 70s. We are also honored to be joined by Laron P. Brooks, Associate Curator for Modern and Contemporary Collections at the Getty Research Institute. With special, specialization in African American art, Dr. Brooks is a critical member of the Getty's new African American Art, in, art History Initiative launched in 2018 to establish the Getty Research Center as a major center for the study of African American art and art history. Without further ado, I'm pleased to transition to Kevin, Tammy, and Laurent. And like you, I'm looking forward to hearing and learning from their insights into Lawrence's work and the timely topic of America's ongoing struggle. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Randy. Um, we're really honored to be here. I know I speak for Tammy and Laurent when we say we're excited to talk about uh, Lawrence and his contribution, which uh, you know is longstanding, but I think we all can agree uh, is only more important as we go on. I want to start by thinking about Lawrence's connection to the Schomburg Center, um, which, as you mentioned, um, starts almost as soon as Lawrence is in New York. Um, and I want to think about it uh, with Tammy first. How do you contextualize for us um, Lawrence's study at the Schomburg, both in his earlier works and what he worked with Augusta Savage and his general uh, landing in Harlem and what that means? Yes, hi, my name is Tammy Lawson and uh, Jacob Lawrence um, came to Harlem when he was 13 years old and um, that was 1930. Um, even then the uh, uh, the Negro Division at or the 135th Street Branch Library was uh, a cultural hub here in Harlem. There was always something going on. Um, Augusta Savage had um, one of her art schools here and she uh, 
Jacob Lawrence was always at the library. He um, used the library. Elaine Locke actually had an education program here at the library at the time. So Augusta Savage was here um, teaching. Um, Charles Alston was here teaching. And he had the books and he had Mr. Schomburg's collection to look at. Elaine Locke, like I said, um, was encouraging um, Black artists to look to Africa and um, to uh, use the collection and to make a, um, to produce art that had a positive impact on people. I love that idea and looking back and of course, uh, Elaine Locke, uh, you know, helped found uh, adult education in America. And we don't talk about that a lot, but one of the places that adult education uh, became first widely widespread is at the Schomburg Center in the 30s and Ella Baker is here then, right. Elaine Locke. There's really a, a, a combination from the start of activism, archiving and education uh, and of course art. Um, I wonder if we might think about that moment a little bit and Laurent jump in here how you might want. Um, you know what is that moment like as Lawrence is starting to figure out these ideas that eventually yeah. lead first to the Great Migration series, his first great series, uh, and then later on to the Struggle series. Well, you know, Lawrence is a child of migrations. When, uh, you know, his parents uh, separated, they moved to, you know, uh, East End in Philadelphia, and then 19, as Tammy said, and then 1930, they uh, were in Harlem without their mother, who joined them later. And so Lawrence was sort of the perfect, um, the public library was the perfect place for Lawrence because his, when his mother got here, she was working as a domestic and he and his siblings, where would they go after school, right? And so when they got here, Lawrence, within context, we have to think about what uh, the Schomburg was at that particular moment, how many black libraries were there outside of um, historically black uh, colleges and universities, right? And so the Schomburg being uh, part of the emergence of what is a, sort of a critical deep black memory, right? A transatlantic black memory, uh, beginning in someone's home and then spreading out, right? And so, so Lawrence stepped right into that moment in Harlem, Charles Seifert, right? Uh, Otto Schomburg, he stepped right in there. And so it was the perfect place. But before uh, uh, the Schomburg, he had met uh, Charles Austin at the Utopia Children's Center Right. And then when Alston was teaching uh, and Savage were teaching in the um, Harlem Arts Center at the Schomburg, think about that art and right the, the text, the, the history text, all in one particular place. And so it seemed to me as a child of migration, ending up at a, a publicly accessible collection of ever expanding text on black history and never deepening right text on black history as more scholarship uh, comes it comes i mean what was there really in 1930 right and so lawrence stepped right into that so it makes sense to me that narrative and his narrative series will come would, would, would be birthed in. at the same time uh you know it going public i think is something that uh, lawrence is invested in he's invested in a kind of uh public art when you say isn't he and at the mm -hmm. same time right after that is the WPA years where, you know, these kind of public concerns are coming forth. How do you uh, think about the WPA years and Lawrence and how do we look sort of outside of Lawrence and all the artists who are around the Schomburg working in the WPA in Harlem uh, and in the States? Well, you know, Kevin, let's get to the root of it. What exactly is a scholar in 1930? Right, because if we're depending on uh, universities and academia as a sole source of scholars, or you know, what a scholar is, then we're going to be at a loss for the, the amount of history that came out of that moment. Because plenty of people weren't scholars, if that's the, the criteria. Right. And so, if you think about someone like James Baldwin, right? So th there's a secondary education uh, that happened uh, uh, in cultural circles in in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, secondhand books. Uh, public uh, intellectuals. I mean, there was a whole different stream of, of thinking in terms of um, intellectual debates that were not necessarily inside of academia, but the, 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 the Schomburg was part of what would what, what considered, you know, um, the source of, of what, you know, public scholars and what people considered to be uh, uh, an education. So, but Laurent, you were talking mm -hmm. about education, what education means, and I think that's really critical for mm -hmm. us to remember that Lawrence is not alone in coming to the Schomburg. In fact, he's part of a hungry wave of people uh, in the reading room 
right. finding each other, finding materials and, and educating themselves. And I've always thought, I mean, partially this is by being a poet, there's a level of autodidact in all these <laughs> artists. You know, you That's can't right. depend, especially as a black artist on being told all those things. I grew up in Kansas in part, no one told mm. me uh, Langston Hughes lived down the street. You know, I had to leave to find that out. <laughs> and I think that what's nice about Harlem at this moment is you actually found that out. He did live down the street and you knew mm -hmm. that. And you might, if you're fortunate, uh, get to hang out with him at the Y or, you know, like at, in the Schomburg itself. So there's a kind of connectivity that the space itself provides. And, and let's think about what, 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 what makes a Harlem, right? And so within the context of thinking 1930, how much access did African-Americans have to higher education? I mean, what were the barriers we had to face? We still face barriers, but what were the barriers in 1930 we, we had to face in order to get into a college, in order to get into a majority white college, right? And so we're talking about secondary education, high school, all these things had to be in line. So if we're talking about the children of migrants, we're talking from the South, we're talking about uh, children uh, of people who worked the land, right? Who came into the city and so what resources were there there for, for them in, in New York or in Chicago or in St. Louis or wherever they ended up on the great migration and so having access to a public library and not only a public library, right, but a library that specifically dealt with black people. What and in a context where if you get a, a, a history book in high school, you may not see your history in that book if you're an African American beyond slavery. So what did it mean to have a deep history? What did it mean to have a deep history going back to the continent of Africa and the great civilizations there, right? The, 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 the whole dialogue of kings and queens. And then when you get to the United States, someone like Harriet Tubman is glorified, right? Someone like Frederick Douglass is glorified. But that's the context of a deep well of black writers writing these histories who did not necessarily need PhDs to be considered scholars. So Tammy, I, I, I jump in please whenever you want, but also I want you to think about and help us think about Augusta Savage. You, you know, we have a large, if I think the world's what? largest collection of Augusta Savage, but she's so important uh, as an artist, flat out and stop. But in this context, as a teacher of, of Lawrence, can you help us understand sort of how she taught, what happened there and the other connections Lawrence would have made? Oh yeah, definitely. So Augusta Savage was so important because not only did she teach and train people, she also took them with her. As she gained information, as she gained status, uh, her students then were her teachers in other programs. Then she, her and Charles Austin and Mr. Schomburg and um, um, George S. Seabrook Powell, they all uh, started the Harlem Artists Guild um, in the 30s to uh, make sure that the black artists in Harlem would get jobs in the WPA. So now, uh, and, and Norman Lewis, he was a teacher with uh, working with, uh, with Augusta Savage he now is the treasurer in the Harlem Artists Guild. Charles Alston gets a, a directorship at the mural program. He pulls Jacob Lawrence in to help him do a mural. Jacob Lawrence is 19. Augusta Savage continues teaching. Matter of fact, her WPA um, uh, uh, classes that she taught were the model for the whole nation. You have all these people, you have W.E.B. Du Bois here, you have James Weldon Johnson here, Harlem Hospitals across the street, Augusta Savage is here, Norman Lewis is here, Ernie Crishlow, uh, so many art artists, they're feeding off of each other, they're learning from each other, and then the collection is just out in the open. You have the Af we have the Blondio Theater Arts Collection, you have uh, pieces that are in this collection that artists actually used in still lives and in other paintings. So um, he, although he may not had access to American education formally, he had the best education. He had the best education right here at the Schomburg Center. Definitely, and, and, Tammy, and Tammy, to your point, when Lawrence arrived in the city, he walked into a very sophisticated mentorship structure. Yes. Right? As soon as he met Charles Alston, who I believe was studying uh, in college, at a college in the city, Charles Alston gave him or rented a space to him in his own studio, right? So in that studio, they had books, 
right? They were constantly studying. At one point, I think it was at 33 125th Street, uh, Bearden had a studio, um, Bob Blackburn had a studio there, Claude McKay was in that building, right? And so Lawrence was all up in that building, right? And so Augusta Savage, in one of his interviews, uh, Lawrence calls Augusta Savage one of the most professional people he had ever met as a kid. Right. And so there's that there's that professionalism that he was also being taught during an era of segregation in which the downtown world was not trying to really mess with the uptown world. And so in this uptown world, this cradle of black uh, of, of the Renaissance and, and sort of leaning toward the 1940s, you know, post Renaissance. Right. We find Lawrence it's just in the cradle of the most sophisticated thinking about race and visual culture, I believe, I believe in the country. Well, I love that you've taken us to uh, to the 40s, too, and thinking a little bit as he's starting to think about the Great Migration series. Um, just really quickly, how do we think about that series and how that series is different from the Struggle series? Um, you know, I think he learned so much in the Great Migration about narration, about research, um, but also about sort of format and, and, you know, it almost reads like, um, you know, kind of church panels, like you're get, getting the lessons uh, that you might see in stained glass. And I want to talk about his style a little bit uh, more too, but for now, like, what would you say his vision difference between the Great Migration series, which people may know, and we can uh, show them a little bit of, and the American Struggle series? Well, you know, I mean, how many books in the Great Migration were there in 1940, <laughs> right? And so he's in this really interesting position. He's a historian and he's an artist. Uh, he made that series, I believe, 1940 in one year. He worked on them simultaneously with uh, the woman who would then become his wife, Gwendolyn uh, Knight, right? And he did it in that studio on 125th Street, right? A 33, 125th Street. I don't know. What is that now? Is that a... Is that a Target or like, <laughs> it's, it's something? Is it a Whole Foods? About, what, right? what is that? How a neighborhood changes. Yeah. Right. How a neighborhood changes, and over time, we still feel the presence uh, or the impact that they made. Right. And sure. so, he's a historian. He he is really writing one of the first texts or painting, writing and painting together, one of the first combined texts of the Great Migration uh, that was still going on. <laughs> that was still going on. And so it's a primary record. It's a primary material. Yeah. That's right. And, and I love he, that idea because what he's looking at are primary materials. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. He's not looking at books about the Great Migration. He's looking at records of the Great Migration and testimonies and talking to people. And, and what I love about the series itself is then he presents it as just factual uh, kind of information. This is what they did. They came this way many times they're leaving because of lynchings. You know, he's very much documenting as much as he's testifying and maybe there's no difference. Tammy. Right, yeah, I was gonna say that um, Lawrence also, he made it plain and simple. The, the texts go along with the paintings and he wanted everyone to understand. And that's how come I think the, the texts are so long because it was a living history and it was a testimony and uh, he came out of that uh, experience. So he wanted people, he wanted it to be available to people, mm -hmm. to everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah, I well, I love that idea. We're, we're circling that I think is about scholarship, public and private. Um, you know, what is a scholar? I think what is an artist? What is an activist? I think that in African-American culture, these questions aren't uh, so much asked as yes is the answer to, to them. Um, I wonder too about what story we think he wanted to tell with struggle specifically. How do we place it um, given sort of that it's a few years later and abstraction is ruling the day. There's a, there's a very different sort of if you open the, our histories now and certainly at the time, uh, there's a different narrative we tell about what was popular, what was art. Um, how do you think, so these two different questions, what is yeah. the story he wanted to tell and how did it fit or not fit with what was being told elsewhere? Well, I'm, I'm going to back it up a little bit, right? Please, and please. so, again, right, as soon as he got to Harlem, uh, he was being taught by people who, who uh, uh, emphasize art and activism. 
right? The WPA, uh, Works Progress Administration, was sort of a cauldron of artists who were socially progressive, influenced by the Mexican muralists, uh, Orozco, Siqueiros, uh, uh, Rivera, and you know they were really about how do we educate the people through visual art. And so Lawrence, uh, we also learned from Charles Alston, right? Charles Alston, uh, I believe, introduced him to one of the Mexican muralists, right? Uh, and so we have Alston, who's making magic and medicine at the at Harlem Hospital in '36. And so Lawrence was sort of inducted into this idea of narrative storytelling. And his own study, walking to the Metropolitan Museum, right, going to the uh, Museum of Modern Art, his own study of how uh, the history of narrative storytelling, right, through visual art. I mean, he studied, he was a scholar, he studied. And so when we get to the Great Migration, that it's definitely a masterpiece of social activism. Right? To inform the country what's going on and to put Black people at the center of that dynamic, uh, that dynamic, dynamic series. And so when we get to uh, the, the 1940s and 50s, it's already in him and he's not going to leave it because he recognizes that it has an impact. It's who he is and it's, it's where he's from. And not only that, then he, he's mega successful. Mm -hmm. he, he is a one of a kind. There's, there's rarely an artist, a living artist, who has the fame that he has while he was living, not only as a young man, but throughout his whole career. So mm -hmm. he was blessed. He, he, found, he found his his lane. And regardless of what was going on, um, he had his lane. And that's, mm -hmm. what, he, that's what he did. But yeah, he's, he was. He, well, how is his, since we backed up a hair, how is his, you called it lane, I might call it his patch of ground or, or whatever, his, his home. Um, how is his home and homing different than say uh, Aaron Douglas, whose work uh, also is a mural, you know, his murals grace the Schaumburg to this day and are part of the WPA and I think are so central to uh, that identity. But I feel like they're they are much more metaphoric, uh, yeah. much more big, big sweeping lyrical. Right. And uh, I wouldn't call them exactly narrative, even though they're series. Uh, how do we juxtapose them for people who, uh, you know, might want to hear a little bit more about that. Well, I think Aaron Douglas uh, was in, in the phase in which he was doing uh, that 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 kind of work, that abstract work. Uh, I think that he was more into a sort of uh, poetics, mm. right? So we see he, him, and uh, Langston Hughes when they come together. Uh, Aaron Douglas would make a print. And then Langston Hughes would, would write a, a blues poem. They would often be shown together. And so, you know, I think Aaron Douglas, he, he had an educational function, right? I mean, his, his silhouettes or his, his figures did have the Egyptian silhouette and many different uh, Northern and Sub-Saharan uh, references. But, no, uh, but Lawrence is very specifically uh, giving us a, a, like to Tammy's point, a readable history, right? It's more sociological. It's poetic. But it's more, but it has a serious sociological edge. And in that is the idea of truth and fact. Aaron Douglas doesn't really give us, give us that. Mm -hmm. Lawrence is going for truth and fact. And I also think maybe because uh, Aaron Douglas was older, mm -hmm. uh, Jacob Lawrence, like by the time he was 13, he was working with masters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was working with masters. He like, mm -hmm. like Lamon said, uh, Augusta Savage was like so professional. He was in all these schools, uh, art schools. He he was uh, put on the FAP, the Federal Arts Project, um, the Easel Project, the Mural Project. So he he just had an advantage to other people. He was just he had so much poured into him, so much life poured into him at such an early age that it just shaped him. The Schomburg Center and the people that were here just molded him his his he just had an inc incredible experience and was able to move forward with it with confidence and, yeah and you know tammy how do we how do we qualify or quantify black genius right mm -hmm. and so you know they were masters right alston savage bearden they all were masters and so but his teachers savage alston they kind of let him be mm -hmm. right they were very for, uh, uh, academically trained 
but they saw Jacob and they were just like, he, he's painting with uh, a poster paint, <laughs> right? They didn't say you need to move the oil to be considered to be authentic or to be considered to be, you know, a real painter. They let Jacob, young Jacob, continue to use uh, water-based uh, paints, mm -hmm. right? And so they saw a level of genius in him and they knew how to handle it. And some of that was just be around us. Yeah. We can't really instruct you on your path. Just be right. around us. Well, I wanted to... I, I want to get to struggle because I could talk all day about the 20s and 30s of Harlem and New York, but maybe uh, talking about technique and talking about materials is a way to do that. You know, how do we see struggle working differently, both the struggle artistically just with media and the struggle in terms of uh, the American struggle he's trying to depict? And one of the things I was struck by uh, in looking over the catalog is just this quote from him. Uh, about what he's trying to do. Uh, he says in December 16, 1954, the paintings which I propose to do will depict the struggles of a people to create a nation and their attempt to build a democracy. Now, this is an attempt that we might say is still underway. Um, and I want to think about that. But I also want to talk about what do we think in this moment in 54, when he's starting to paint um, this struggle and proposing it, uh, and proposing a large canvas, as it were, you know, how, how do we take that? Um, so in 46, he's invited by Joseph Albers, who comes from the Bauhaus uh, lineage. Uh, he's invited by Joseph Albers to teach at Black Mountain College, which is a very progressive, radical uh, uh, art uh, uh, college in was. Uh, in North Carolina, Asheville. It's near Asheville. Uh, Joseph Albers respected him so much that he rented, rented a, a car on a train for uh, Jacob and Gwendolyn. They were married then to get to the college so that they would not have to uh, uh, be subject to segregation, right? And travel on a train. Yeah. That's, how much, that's how much a painter's painter respected young Jacob Lawrence, right? right? right. And so, uh, what he learned from uh, from Albers, I'm, I'm getting to the point. What he learned from Albers, what he learned from Albers is that Albers Albers thought about uh, the pure form. Mm -hmm. and so Jake, Jacob Lawrence, when you see his figures, he he, he understood them as pure form. But uh, but then he, but but he also puts enough characterization on them that you see them as people. <laughs> right. And so when we get when we get to something like the struggle series, he's at his height in terms of his ability to manipulate uh, form to communicate his own feelings about history, what's going on, and in a sort of bebop way, right? In an advanced way, when we see the breaking, uh, we see uh, the this, this, this sort of complicated structures. I mean, we can go back to the idea of Picasso, we can go back to the idea of African uh, sculpture and, and the Sanufo. I mean, he's, he's dealing with it in, in a very complicated way, in the way that a musician uh, at the same time would be, uh, or, you know, someone, uh, Sonny Stitt, you know, like a real hard bop saxophonist would break up song. And so he's at his height then, but then he, his ability to communicate the idea of struggle, branching out from uh, solely African-American narratives, it's, 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 it's something new. It's something new. Well, I wonder how we place that. Oh, Tammy, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead. You go ahead. Uh, I wonder how we place that in, you know, Albers and, you know, the sort of move toward abstraction, the abex, heroic, solo, expressionistic artist after the war, you know, uh, painting in a garret or in a big old studio, uh, maybe not even showing, but instead you have this, you know, a private art there, and then you have this public art. How do we t figure his abstraction? Or is it, uh, like you said, a kind of abstraction like bebop? Well, I th black artists still deal with that. <laughs> black artists today still uh, deal with the, with the, um, with a sort of discriminatory uh, exclusion from the mainstream art world when they deal with advanced ideas through abstraction. And that Jacob Lawrence actually um, made figures that were in both worlds because they were so smart, right? I think it communicated his modernity to people who cared about aesthetics. And it also communicated his importance to community to people who cared about the narrative. Well, that's a well said. I wonder uh, about this idea 
about blackness and abstraction, which Laurent and I uh, talked about. Uh, I had almost stopped because we were about to think about it too much, but I want to think about it here. You know, there's something Ralph Ellison says about that, that, you know, black folks are used to thinking about abstraction and blackness itself um, has an abstract quality. And I wondered about how he's able to capture that, because I think he is uh, in the struggle series. Uh, he seems to me to be collapsing a lot of planes at once. And mm -hmm. one of these planes is uh, an existential one. Um, how do we think about that? And right. so we have someone like Jacob Lawrence, if he goes toward pure, ab pure abstraction, you know, he kind of does lose the, the public that he, was, he, he served almost half his life to this point to educate, right? Right. Uh, and so, you know, a black artist dealing with abstraction deals with those two sides to follow their own interests in abstraction. And you can go across, uh, uh, Kev, you can think of, you know, the, the modernist poets, you can think of Gwendolyn Brooks, you can, you know, uh, you can think of who they, they, they were so sophisticated in the ways in which they understood the discipline that they were uh, uh, aesthetically modern, but they also had to, to, to they also chose to include a social consciousness in that modernity, where the idea of you know uh, modernism and abstraction, at least in the late 20th century, is about the rugged individualism, <laughs> right? This idea of the rugged individual artist who damned the world is about my feelings. You know, method acting arrives around this time, dig deep, you know, and find that and what have you. And so, you know, coming from his tradition, you know, Lawrence is really at the top tier. Have, of a certain kind of socially responsible artist. And so he's between these two worlds. He's between these two worlds. And so abstraction, as you see in the struggle series, uh, that it's so turned toward the idea of revolution, the mm -hmm. every man in revolution. And so if we go from the migration series talking about the ways in which this migration was itself a, a revolution, an American revolution that these people chose where their labor should be, right? right? Uh, to stop the overture, revolution. John Brown, revolution. There's right. a thing here, right? <laughs> and so when he gets to the struggle series, he has a sort of panorama of different experiences, but they all point toward revolution. If we think of the civil rights movement, we're thinking about an interracial group of people who are marching right, for an American revolution, because it wasn't just black people, even though a lot of it did come out of the black church, and Jacob Lawrence did go to Abyssinian for a little while, right? Okay. So, so, so there, there's a mix, but, you know, struggle is the product of a whole history of a social responsibility, and he's just widening the perspective. Well, what do we think about uh, our democracy that he's trying to understand? How are we informed by it? You know, we have Emmett Till, we have the, the start of the Montgomery uh, movement in 55. It's really, you know, he's painting at such a uh, tempestuous time, uh, one that's much like our own. So I'd love to understand how he's painting um, then and w how all that energy, which I think you've talked about a little bit, how all that energy comes to bear, but also, you know, thinking about it now, what's it mean to us now to look back on the struggle series and see the struggle left unfinished? Yeah. What do you think, Tammy? These are small questions, I know. Like, right. <laughs> how, how, uh, let's answer the American democracy and struggle. <laughs> let's right solve it. Right in the next 10 minutes. Well, I mean, I think he's anti-authoritarian. Sure. You know, I think at, at root, you know, he's talking about working people, poor people, people, people uh, the formerly enslaved, the, uh, uh, the colonized, and here we're just dealing with the American colonies, right? But, but the colonized, the formerly enslaved, the, the, the poor, itinerant worker, he's talking about people rising up and recognizing their rights and them acting on it. So it makes sense that this Paul Revere uh, in one of those. It makes sense that uh, I believe in one of the one of the first paintings in the struggle series, there's Christmas addicts bleeding. Yeah. Right? There's Christmas addicts bleeding. And so you know, it's 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 an extension of a moral compass that is directed toward revolution, right? And so if we think about the Musk, uh, Montgomery movement of the bus boycott and what have you, you know, Lawrence is in line with 
at least in theme or at this, the, the moral center of his work is that things must change. And we have to think about the roots of what this democracy is because it's messy. Yeah. This democracy is messy. Yeah. Why do y'all think he, he picks history to depict the mess instead of painting what's right outside or going to Birmingham? I mean, why do y'all think that? Tammy, what do you think uh, his historical sense tells us? I think that uh, I think that he he well that was his education. I think that he wanted to, you know, he was a people person. I think one of the schools, the Utopia School, that he um, that he was at was a socialist school. So his his whole politic is um, the people, and I think his common denominator was always to get the message out to the people. Like Laurent had spoke about earlier with him um, being influenced by Alston and meeting um, the uh, great uh, Mexican muralists, the murals themselves were uh, the newspaper, mm. beautiful newspaper, but that, that was the news. That's, that's what's happening, that's what's up. And I think that he used painting um, like, a, like a book, but so that everybody could understand and he wanted to get the message out and he wanted he wanted everybody he wanted his paintings to be felt and acknowledged by everyone yeah and and, and there's an evangelical kind of edge to the struggle series huh, you know i mean there 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 is a way in which the dominant figures in that series seem to be preaching there seems to be a godliness behind the power of, mm -hmm. of some of those figures and a lot of figures in his series, right? And right. so if we think about uh, the preacher, the idea of the preacher, the idea of the person who knows what the, the John Browns and not in the struggle series, but in the struggle series, you do have those sort of dominant personality, sure. right? Like right over Christmas addicts, there's the figure, right? right? Pointing, right? And so, you know, that is for me sort of in line or it rhymes with the idea of what is the moral center of what was the moral center of the co of the country at that moment? And so it's easier to tell that through history. Yeah. The the hard part uh, in terms of the civil rights movement, you know, it's it's they, they were there they were there in the then current context in which uh, they were not pointing necessarily pointing to history. They were pointing toward uh, what could be well. They were using history, but it wasn't in a, such a didactic way. I mean, what Lawrence is doing is using history because it's He's a teacher. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, Lawrence is pointing, a teacher. Pointing is almost metaphoric too, as well as gestural in the paintings. Uh, I'm, you know, just glancing at them while we're talking and I'm struck over and over again by the angularity, both of the figures and then of the sort of bayonets or spears or uh, any aspect. And even the bleeding figure of Crispus Attucks is, is right. sort of dead center and somehow angular. Um, I wonder about that angular quality because to me, that's some of that's also a metaphor for how mm -hmm. he's approaching this this history. He's he's not he's doing exactly what you say, truth and facts, but he's also saying he's offering a corrective, isn't he? Um, yeah, telling yeah. us, you know, mm -hmm. this is the history left out uh, or not on our walls. Um, this is the blood and the angles and the bayonets of history that are also um, impacting us today. And he's like a cinematographer taking an odd angle into a scene, right? If we think of Picasso, if we think of the ways in which uh, analytic cubism, there is a multitude of angles into a particular painting. He's using the logic of modern or the history of modern painting. And if you remove the eyes, the ears, the recognizable things uh, in the struggle series, if you remove those things that signify human, you have an abstract expressionist painting. <laughs> you you have you have a rugged abstract expressionist painting, yeah. And so he he's just riding riding that line, and 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 these these historical figures were a way for him to bring his point about the current stat the current state of affairs forward. Well, I want to wrap up here in a moment, though I could talk all day about these very questions, um, and I have a question for both of you, but I also want to think uh, just a, a beat or two more uh, about that angle into history. Um, and, and for me, I'm, I'm struck seeing uh, the series about how bloody many of them are. Um, 
it reminds me a bit of the Faith Ringgold painting where it's mm -hmm. almost like a race riot that's now, um, you know, thinking, helping us think about um, where we are now, I think, and talk, but also how art history, as well as history history, sometimes doesn't always tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. um, by, as Laurent said, focusing on individuals, we can sort of lose the community or the communal or the conflagration outside, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you, important do you think, you know, his depiction of violence, I don't know how else to put it, is in thinking of struggle. Uh, what is he saying about struggle, but also about that time and of course our uh, time that folks are also in the street protesting uh, and filled with unrest. What do you think about that, Tam? Well, I, you know, it, it's not textbook. It's not just mm -hmm. a single person. It's, it's the little person getting out there, uh, getting in some good trouble. Good trouble. Uh -huh. And um, that's what the struggle is. It, you, you are, you're going to get your head bumped. You're gonna, you, you may bleed, but mm -hmm. you got to fight on. And I think that's why you see all the fighting, the, the struggle, because right. it's not, um, you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to get in there. And do you think it's just violence or do you think it's sort of the blood of renewal? Uh, how do you think of it? It could be both, but I think that, I think that, uh, it, that he's, that it's just what it is. There's going to be struggle, the struggle, whatever, it, whatever conflict that comes with it. Okay. And I think it's still hopeful, but it comes with it. And he's just depicting it. That's right. I mean, and to Tammy's point, it hasn't changed. Let's do, you turn on the television today. We're still right there. We're still there. And so what? What's an artist to do today? This is beyond our purview, <laughs> uh, talking about struggle. But I, 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 you know, every day I have to think about this, both as a writer and as someone who thinks about this as a cultural organization. Where, what's the struggle now? If we were going to pick up and do a series, would it be historical? Would it be, um, you know, about what's in the street happening? Uh, how, do, how do artists look ahead? Uh, and how does Lawrence help us do that? Well, I mean, no, go ahead, Tammy. You want to handle that? No, no, no. I want you to do it because I was <laughs> yeah. gonna, actually Kevin See, as, artist, years, I to as ask a poet. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> what do you? I, I, I know one of the greatest poets actually in America. <laughs> right? It for us, please. I can't do it. Y'all got to do it. Well, I mean, I, I think artists need to stay need, need to be need to find their purpose. Need to to need to think about their their work and what are the sources sources that put them in the arena of thinking about something. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think what artists it, it's hard because you know uh, uh, the boys had the what's that artist propaganda. Yeah, he says any art that isn't propaganda is of no use to me. He says. Right. But, but 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 then you go James Baldwin. You know, sentimentality is the death of art. Mm -hmm. Right, and, both and, and, and true, the, of course, <laughs> they're both kind of right, you know. Right, you know, it's it, it so you know, it's it's so you know, it really it really d depends upon um, what where the artist is at. I mean, I think I think to pre to try to predetermine where work of art goes to t will determine the character of that work, and if, and if the work. If the work's character is not a true expression of the artist's intention, then it may not be very good. Hmm. It may be political, but it may not be very good. Interesting. Right. Tammy, what do you think? Wow. I think that the artist, um, as an activist, that an artist, um, without being sentimental, but should point out things that we wouldn't normally see with our own eye. Mm -hmm. And I think the beauty of an artist or the talent of the artist is that they can make it beautiful at the same time, but mm -hmm. also awaken you or make you aware of something at the same time. So Strong I animation. think that uh, to me is one of the duties or one of the things that artists that art does, that art can do in this moment. I don't think we can put it better than that. Um, that's so wonderful to say. I really love 
what you've all said about Lawrence. Um, any last thoughts as we we uh, say thank you for coming and and you know look ahead to seeing the struggle series uh, when you can see in person. Any last thoughts? Let's go first, Tammy. Well, I just want to say in keeping the keeping in the tradition of the Schomburg Center being a cultural hub and also being um, a place where we teach children and um, teach critical thinking that um, we had an opportunity uh, to work with uh, um, Charles Kim and Six Foot Press and with the uh, uh, Peabody Exit Essex Museum um, who came to us because we have a, a beautiful teen curators program and the children were asked to write essays about the struggle. Can I hold up the book? Fine with me, yeah. It's so me. our teen curators, um, 15 to 18 year old, were um, given a task to look at the uh, struggle series related back to their struggle today mm -hmm. and that they're published. And I just love the way that um, still um, Augusta Savage teaching um, Jacob Lawrence still teaching and then the kids right now using the collection and able to, you know, circle back to Jacob Lawrence. Well, and to see themselves in print, which I think is right. Right. Uh, yeah. too. Laron? You know, I think Tammy said it, continue to be informed. You know, don't, don't necessarily think of history as the past, but be informed by uh, the ways in which it is also the present. And I think this series definitely emphasizes that. But but, you know, don't think history is just the past. Well, and, and I think as this conversation has shown uh, over and over again, you know, there's still more to learn. I learn every time I talk to y'all. Um, and, uh, you know, these are figures I heard of and know about, but we can always dig in and find out more. So I really appreciate you uh, telling us so much, also digging so deeply and, and throwing the net wide. I'm sorry, I'm mixing metaphors, but, um, you know, making that struggle real uh, is really a big part of what I think the Schomburg Center does, what the Met's doing with this exhibition. And so thank you very much and we appreciate y'all's time. Thank, thank you. you.